we finished. I just want to make sure that I'm correct. We went over the the mutagens, but we didn't go over the repair strategies, right? So I'm just touching on a couple of repair strategies here. Um, so let's okay, let's talk about how DNA molecule can remain so stable in terms of the sequence. So we mentioned that replication is pretty accurate, right? Mistake, mistakes in replication are fairly rare. It turns out that during the synthesis, the replication complex proofreads the nucleotide. So if some, if for instance, due to some unfortunate mistake, instead of a T pair, a C pair is formed. DNA polymerase will detect this unmatching nucleotides. They will be excised. Well, not both of them. C will be excised or whatever. The freshly inserted nucleotide will be excised and the proper one will be inserted instead. Does that make sense? Think of it as, you know, you typing a text and you go in back, you type in text into Word and you're going back looking at those red squiggly lines uh, highlighting the words that are supposedly have a mistake in them. Okay, same, same idea. And then you go back and correct it. Now, uh, what happens if mutation is induced after the replication? So in this case, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, we're going we're gonna to look at the example of UV light induced thiamine dimers. Okay. So, this is what happens when DNA molecule is exposed to UV light. Two adjacent thiamines will form uh, a dimer. And then there are two possibilities for the repair. One possibility, if light, light is still present, I call it, you know, repair, DNA repair in the light, the enzyme called photolyase binds to the diamond dimer and chemically cleaves the bond between the two diamond residues. And since the bond is cleaved, it's now has now has a normal structure, two diamonds are separated. So you've got intact DNA molecule. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? What if there is no light and photoreactivation is impossible? In this case, we have nucleotide excision repair. First, the enzyme called nuclease introduces cuts into the damaged strand. So it essentially breaks the phosphate bonds between two adjacent nucleotides. Does that make sense? And then the our old body helicase binds to the section that is separated from the rest of the DNA and unwinds it. But this unwinding results in the removal of the entire section out of the DNA molecule, out of the double strand. Now we have this gap that is filled by our another old body enzyme called DNA polymerase 1. Okay? So this part here refers to nucleotide excision repair, while this part here refers to photoreactivation. Does that make sense to you? It's pretty, pretty simple. Now, why do we care about mutations in the DNA of bacteria? Well, first and foremost, think about this. I'm kind of starting backwards here to give you a 
justification about the experiment, to talk about the experiment that we're going to talk about. Imagine that you are developing a new drug, new household chemical, anything. You need to test this drug or a chemical among other features for its ability or rather inability to cause mutations. Ideally, of course, you should take 10,000 people, expose them to this chemical and observe them over 15 years, you know, to see if they develop any cancers, which is ethically and cost prohibitive. You can try and do it in mice, but mice are expensive, they aren't people, and the main problem, if you expose a mouse to a chemical, you have no idea where to look for a tumor. And uh, the machine that does mouse MRI costs about the same money as the machine that does human MRI. It's quarter million bucks. Okay, so there are machines that do mouse MRI. So yeah, you can find a tumor, but that's going to be again cost prohibitive. Maybe there is a, a less expensive way to start testing for potential mutagenesis. This test is called Ames test. And it's, it's not super complicated, but there are some concepts that seem somewhat weird or awkward. This is why, as with replication, we're going to carefully uh, deconstruct this method step by step. And I want uh, a unified response. Yeah, we get it. And until I get this unified response, we're not going to move forward. Okay, so don't hesitate to tell me, can you explain it again? I don't understand what's going on. All right? So we're going to start with this first step right over here. This is culture of Salmonella type immurium, okay, bacteria. Salmonella type immurium that grows on the defined medium, okay? Remember what defined medium is. What is so specific about defined medium or synthetic? We know exactly what's in it. Excellent. We know each and every component. And this defined medium is complete. It has all amino acids, all vitamins, carbohydrates that salmonella can possibly need. You with me so far? So we have a bunch of colonies, a whole bunch of colonies. And we use this cloth over here. It's a velvet cloth. And it's sort of a, a, a copy stamp. So we press this velvet cloth against the plate with the colonies so that all the colonies are basically transferred to the cloth in the exactly same order, ge geometrical arrangement, as they are on the original plate. Are you with me? So we make an imprint. Okay? And then we use this cloth to inoculate two other plates. Okay? These two plates are different. Plate on different between each other. Plate on the top is just the same as the original one. Okay, so they are identical. Chemically, it's exactly the same medium. Nothing has changed. Same complete defined medium. You with me so far? You following me? Now, medium on the bottom is different. It is defined. But this time, this medium doesn't have an amino acid, the amino acid, called histidin. Okay? And we can do it because our medium is defined. All we need to do is not add histidine. Does that make sense? When we make the medium, we don't take the can with histidine amino acid from the shelf. We just don't add it. 
you with me so far? I'm going to ask you a very important question. I'm not kidding. Really important question. And it's simple. If which microorganisms, which, okay, no, 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 that's, that's a bad question. Okay. What salmonella should be able to make in order to grow on this medium at the bottom it should be able to make what histidine. histidine does that make sense we do not provide histidine so only cells that can make their own can grow on that plate does that make sense to everybody only if you can make histidine you can grow on the medium without Histidine. Okay. Got it? So we'll look at the growth, and here's what we see. You see how many colonies are on the top? And almost the same number of colonies is at the bottom, except for this one. So this little colony is missing from the histidine negative plate. So this colony that's missing, missing from histidine negative plate, the one that cannot grow on the medium without histidine. These cells, what they don't make? Histidine. Does that make sense to you? Since they don't make histidine, they can't grow on the histidine negative medium. Let's take a breath and I'm going to ask you. Does that make sense to you? It's not going to grow. It's like, you know, humans cannot breathe underwater. That is why they don't live underwater. Right? So this bacterium cannot make histidine. This is why it can't live in the medium without it. Mutants that can't make something. Mutants that require a certain type of nutrition. It's called nutritional mutants, called oxotrophs. So this is so oxotrophs require a specific nutrients to grow. Technically speaking, humans are oxotrophs. Does that make sense to you? Like we, we need like ten amino acids, vitamins, all that good crap. So, we have identified the oxytrophic mutant. And I want to make it, I want to make something really clear. So, normally, look at this. Normally, Salmonella can live without histidine, can make histidine on its own. Is that clear? Random mutation, absolutely random, is identified right over here that deprives salmonella from its ability to make histidine. Now, if you think about it, inability to produce histidine, is that a phenotype? Yeah, it is a phenotype. It's a certain phenotype. It's the appearance, right? Now, that phenotype is defined by what? It's, uh, it, you see phenotype because of the environment, but see, gene expression. Does that make sense? Phenotype is defined by gene expression. Or, in this case, most likely, lack of it. Okay? So, certain gene in Salmonella gets the mutation and becomes dysfunctional. Gene that is necessary for histidine synthesis. Does that make sense? So, we've got a mutant with a mutation in a gene. Now, this mutant is going to be our lab rat in the following experiment. So mutant is the change in the DNA, right? Now in this experiment, first I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do and what we expect to happen. We're going to expose our mutant 
to a mutagen. Sorry, mutagen is blue here. We're going to expose our mutant to a mutagen, potential mutagen. So imagine that this, this blue liquid, whatever it is, indeed has strong mutagenic properties. Okay, let's assume that it is true. Although that's what we're testing, but let's assume. If it is a potential and strong mutagen, what is it going to introduce into the DNA of our lab rat salmonella? That's a very simple question. Mutagen is going to introduce Mutation. mutations. Those mutations are going to be random. Does that make sense? Like, um, like shooting at the wall, blindfolded. You don't know what you're going to hit. Right? So, those random mutations will affect all different genes of Salmonella. And there is a non-zero chance that they will affect the gene that was affected before. And now this gene is, is as a mutation, it cannot, you know, Gene because of which Salmonella cannot produce histidine. Does that make sense? That histidine gene that was mutant can randomly be affected by the new mutagen. Does that make sense? And there is a chance, non-zero chance, that mutation that made Salmonella oxytrophic will revert, will come back to its original genotype. Does that make sense? So let's say, let's say, let me, I think I found a way to explain it a little bit better. Let's assume, let's talk about this gene. Let's assume that there is a base pair, GC, in the original Salmonella, okay, that gets mutated and becomes AT. Okay? You with me so far? Becomes AT. So this is your, we're going to, Name it original. This is going to be oxytroph. Now, imagine that you blast this AT with mutagen. There is a chance that this AT will revert back to GC. Does that make sense? It will mutate it back. My clear. So we're going to call it revertant. Now, revertant in this case essentially is no different from the original wild type microorganism. I'm going to throw another analogy um, down this way. You copy a text, you make a typo, and you don't notice it. Okay, and then another person copies this text. This person doesn't notice your typo, but this person makes another typo and brings your, you know, the original sense of text back. You see what I'm trying to say now? You got it? Like minus by minus gives you plus. Two mistakes gives you, give you the correct answer. Okay, double negative gives you positive. Make sense? Understand? Now, do you understand the idea of reversion? That, you know, we can get mutant to come back to its wild type, to its original genotype. Okay, make sense? So, basically the outcome is this. If this chemical right here is mutagenic, there is a non-zero chance that it will bring our oxytrophic mutant back to wild type microorganism. It will return oxytrophic phenotype into wild type phenotype. So what we do, we have two vials. In fact, we should have probably five or six considering all the controls that we need. But in this image, there are only two. This vial is not exposed to a mutagen. This vial on the right is exposed to the mutagen. 
That makes sense? If chemical is mutagenic, oxytrophic mutant goes back to wild type and regains its ability to grow on the histidine negative medium. Without the mutagen, we don't have that same level of mutations. So we may see, I don't know, a couple of revertants, but not really a lot. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So basically, in our analogy, you know, double negatives gives you positive. This oxytrophic mutant is your first negative, first mutation. And exposure to this mutagen in the right bottom corner is your second negative, second mutation. And if these two mutations strike the same gene, the same nucleotide in the same gene, that one mutation cancels another. Second mutation cancels the first one. Okay? And that second mutation is essentially induced by this possible mutagen. So if we see the growth on the histidine negative medium, this chemical has mutagenic properties. What if, instead of possible mutagen, we will add water? Are we going to see any growth? No. no. You got it? That understood? Why do... Yes. How many... How low is the chance of it changing it back? It's very low. Type? It's very low. So you're going to have to do that a lot. Once. It's just once because the, you're gonna you're gonna find out that the concentration of microorganisms in some of your samples that you tested on Tuesday is well considerable okay and if you expose not a million not a billion but trillions of oxotrophic mutants cells oxotrophic cells if you expose trillions if the chance is one in a billion, if you have trillion, you have thousand cells, you know? So it's pretty good chance. Does that make sense? Yeah. This is why this is why it's so convenient. Because bacteria grow fast, they dirt cheap. And you can work with billions of remember, individual organisms. I'm not sure that we have that number of mice on earth okay you can't possibly expose millions of mice to a mutagen make sense so this is the advantage of the method now first of all this image doesn't do justice to all the controls that we should run there should be no mutagen at all you know rat act we're going to talk to about liver extract there's probably going to be some other chemical that is a known non-mutagenic like water or I don't know ethanol or something like that sodium chloride um, some more controls but my question for you here is why liver extract why do we use it why do we add to some samples liver extract because that's the Part of the body that processes chemicals mm -hmm. because if the, this chemical that we test by itself may not be mutagenic but liver enzymes may convert it into a mutagenic chemical or vice versa does that make sense chemical may be mutagenic but liver enzymes can attenuate this mutagenicity that makes sense to you now, I want to be very open and clear. There will be one question, just one, on the AIMS test. The question is going to be big, like a lot of words, and it's complex. It's not easy. It's not easy mainly because there are a lot of words, and you have to read the question and all answers really, really carefully. So I give you a fair warning. I'm not going to tell you what the question is. Uh, basically, it's going to focus on your, like, if you can't understand what's going on during this 
teams test, that will be not, not a problem. Like you spend some time, you read it, you plot it out, you figure out which answer makes sense, it's yours. But if you try just to memorize the steps, answering that question will be really hard. So this question very much will be focused on your understanding of like, not just what we do, but how do we get this result? What is oxotrophic mutants? Why it doesn't grow on histidine poor medium? What happens to oxotrophic mutant when it is exposed on the, to the mutagen? Why after the exposure, this oxotrophic, you know, what was oxotrophic mutant now can grow without histidine? You have to understand this. Am I clear? Moving on. Any questions about this one? Try to straighten it up as much as I can. So, um, uh, prokaryotes have a problem. They don't have sex. Maybe it's not a problem. I don't know. Don't have sexual reproduction. And sexual reproduction is important for genetic diversity. Okay? Exchange between male and female um, species of well, male and female organisms of the same species ensures that there is sufficient amount of genetic diversity which allows for proper adaptation to the rapidly changing environment. Clear? So what do they do instead? Well, if you think about it, technically we can say that sex is the horizontal gene transfer. Okay? So it's not from mother to child. Well, eventually it is, but it's first two, two organisms of opposite sex have to mate to produce zygote, right? Or any other whatever for this particular species, the, the, cell, the cells are called, okay? Bacteria don't have that opportunity, so they engage in exchanging genes between each other. Basically, directly or indirectly, genetic information goes from one bacterial cell into another. Am I clear? We're going to talk about three ways of gene exchange, okay? And we're going to start with transformation. I think it was British scientist, Frederick Griffith, in 1928, well, 1920s, was working with two strains of Streptococcus pneumonia. One strain, it's called Ruff, was non-pathogenic. In fact, rough strain was derived from another smooth strain, which was pathogenic. Okay, they were called rough and smooth as far as I remember for their appearance under the microscope. So pathogenic strain had a capsule, which made it pathogenic, and our strain had no capsule. Okay, so... What does that mean that strain is pathogenic? This strain killed mice. You with me so far? When mice were inoculated with a non-virulent rough strain, they survived. Okay? So Griffith was curious what made the rough strain, because rough strain was derived from smooth strain. So he said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try and kill smooth strain, heat it up, heat inactivate it, and see if it still can cause lethal disease in mice. And it wasn't really surprising that heat inactivated smooth strain, when inoculated in animals, didn't do anything to them. 
Because Booker T. Raymer did. We know. You know, he he didn't know what's going on. Does that make sense? He said, okay, dead bacteria, bacteria that do not replicate, don't kill mice. Good. And then he said, what if we mix? What if what is the that that essence, that molecule, that chemical that actually determines the phenotype? of a microorganism so we presumably we presumably destroyed something in the smooth strain that enabled it pathogenicity what if we mix heat inactivated smooth strain and rough strain and inoculate it in animals now without knowing about griffith experiment if i will tell you we have non-virulent, non-pathogenic strain of streptococci. And we have heat-killed strain of streptococci. It used to be pathogenic, but now it's heat-killed, so it doesn't cause any disease. We mix them together, two things that don't kill mice. And we inoculate mice with that mixture. Do you expect mice to survive from common sense? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Griffith expected the same. And then there was, well, it's a funny moment. Mice died. So he mixed two things that didn't kill mice. Something happened. And mice were dead. So he autopsied mice and isolated from these dead mice a strain of streptococci, which was essentially a live, virulent, smooth strain. Does that make sense to you? And he tested it, and it, yeah, it killed mice all right. So what happened? When smooth strain, the virulent strain, got heat inactivated, cells physically disassembled, and released some of its DNA material into the solution, like into the into the tube, in the form of a plasmid, plasmid that was carrying a virulence factor, gene, or capsule. Okay? When those heat inactivated smooth bacteria, that soup, cooked soup that contained dead cells and floating plasmids. When this soup was mixed with a live R strain, R strain accepted the plasmid, incorporated, it may incorporate it into the chromosome, plasmid sometimes may remain separately in the cytoplasm. But the point is, R strain got transformed by the plasmid from S strain and acquired pathogenic properties that this plasmid carried. Does that make sense to you? So essentially transformation, okay, is a process in which bacterial cell, live bacterial cell, acquires a free DNA in the environment. Does that make sense to you? Which, when transformation was discovered, it gave scientists an enormously powerful instrument that... I, I told you before that Western blot is a pretty cool technique that I like because it's kind of lazy technique. Transformation is lazy technique as well. Well, somewhat. So, why we use it? You can make a plasmid that will contain some gene that you want. Let's... I'm trying to think of something fun. Let's say it's... What's that? Uh, coagulation factor 9. Okay? Part of the coagulation cascade. Factor 9. You have a gene for factor 9. You clone it into a plasmid. That's technicality. Actually, now, to give an idea how advanced this industry is, you don't need to clone. 
yourself. You can call a company and tell them, here's the gene that I want. Here's the plasmid that I want. Make it. And they'll do it because, you know, doing making a copy of the gene. Or you can send them, if it's something specific, you can send them the copy of your gene and tell them, I want it into this plasmid. And they'll do it themselves and we'll, they will send you the plasmid with a target gene back. Okay? This plasmid also usually has an antibiotic resistance gene. Okay? So you take this plasmid, we'll, we're getting there, you take this plasmid, you mix it with special cells, usually it's E. coli, and you shock them with heat. You can do heat shock, sometimes it's electrical shock, but more, more common is heat shock. So it, literally you mix it in the tube, put the tube at 42 degrees Celsius, put it on ice, the temperature difference basically initiates the response in the bacteria, so bacteria opens up and takes up DNA from the environment. Does that make sense? Takes up DNA, then you put this bacteria in the medium, grow it, but you don't know. Some cells got this DNA, some cells didn't. Make sense? So you put microorganism that contains this plasmid onto the medium that has antibiotic. Remember, this plasmid carries antibiotic resistance gene. If your cell got the plasmid, it's also got the resistance to antibiotic. So it can grow on your selective medium. The ones that didn't get anything, they can't grow. Why I say it's a lazy technique? You do transformation in the morning. Well, usually it's not morning. Like you come in the lab, get everything ready. Transformation is done by about noon. You put it in the medium. You come next morning, you got growth. You put your growth on the plate, come next morning, you got colonies. And now you can work with these colonies and figure out, you know, if they have whatever you need. Does that make sense? So it's, it's and it's really fun. It's a really fun experiment. So transformation is when live bacterial cell acquires uh, DNA from the environment. DNA of some dead bacteria, okay? <clears throat> Transduction is carried out by viruses of bacteria that are called bacteriophages. So this is your bacteriophage. Uh, there are many types of them. This particular one, they called, that's not going to be on the exam, on this exam, called T-even because like T2, T4, T6, T8. And they do look like little alien spaceships under the microscope. They, they do look like that. So what happens? So here's the bacteriophage. Note, please note, that bacteriophage DNA is colored, what's that, violet, okay? And bacterial DNA is green. See that? Okay, pretty cool. So bacteriophage DNA enters the cell. It's not here, but it does enter the cell, enters the bacterial cell. And this DNA will start to, DNA of the virus will start to get expressed. Genes get expressed. Does that make sense? So basically, a bacteriophage starts to reproduce inside of a bacterial cell. As the part of that reproduction, Bacterial DNA gets all chopped up. So now you have a soup of bacteriophage proteins, bacteriophage DNA, and fragments of bacterial DNA. Make sense? And at some point, bacteriophage particles start to assemble and package their DNA. So this is a proper bacteriophage, right? The purple DNA. That's the proper one. That's the proper one. But this lousy fella packaged the fragment of bacterial DNA, just accidentally. If you ever coached a, a sports team, kids who are like 10, 11 years old, to the practice, 
you're going to get almost after every practice there is an email. Hey, Jimmy accidentally grabbed the wrong backpack. Does anyone have Jimmy's backpack? And then, oh yeah, I don't know. Johnny got the wrong backpack too, so let's switch. That's what happens. Okay, so that bacteriophage here accidentally grabs the wrong backpack, packages the wrong DNA. Make sense? And then it, you know, tries to infect another bacterial cell. It does, it introduces that uh, DNA molecule that it packaged into a different bacterial cell. So it basically carries it over from one bacterial cell to another. Does that make sense? So bacteriophage grabs the fragment of bacterial DNA from one cell and carries it to another cell. Clear? Now, a few aspects about this type of transduction. This is called generalized transduction. Because there's not really any specifics to it, okay? And bacteriophages that carry out generalized transduction, what do they do to this original bacterial cell? What happens to it in the very end? Simple question. Yeah. It dies. It lyses. Because when those 200 viruses, and I'm not making the number up, can be up to 200 virus particles in one bacterial cell. When they leave, they just burst through. It's like alien movie, 200 times over. Okay? These bacteriophages are called lytic. So, lytic bacteriophages carry out generalized transduction. Does that make sense to you? Well, I'm just seeing people writing, so if you want me to slow down, please tell me to slow down. You may not believe it, but I can do it. Um, now, if there are lytic viruses, you know, it should be something else, right? If there is generalized transduction, there should be some other transduction. Turns out that there are so-called lysogenic bacteriophages. And let's take a glance at what they do and what type of transduction they can carry out. This the lytic, uh, lysogenic page. See it? Now, in this picture, the DNA of the bacteria is violet or purple, and the DNA of bacteriophage is blue. So look at the step number two, and you tell me what happens to the viral DNA after it enters the bacterial cell. It inserts, it inserts itself into the bacterial chromosome. It becomes a part of bacterial genome. Does that make sense to you? Now, this is a pretty smart strategy for the virus, if you think about it. Because every time, it doesn't kill bacterial cell. Remember, it doesn't. You see, it doesn't. This is why we call them lysogenic. So, they can induce lysis in the long-term perspective. So, they can generate lysis, lysogenic. But they don't kill the cell right away. Are we clear about it? And why is it a smart strategy? Well, any ideas? Mm -hmm. It's sitting there every time bacterial cell divides. The prophage, this, this, you know, viral viral genome in the chromosome. It's called prophage. Okay, the dormant one. Every time cell reproduces, it is reproduced as well. 
So it's it it effortlessly spreads through the entire population. As Lisa said, it takes over more and more cells. Now, will it ever leave the chromosome? Yes. If the stress is applied to bacterial population, nutritional stress, antibiotic stress, temperature, there are many there are chemicals that can induce that. I don't remember. There's there's some chemical that can that always leads to excision of the prophage. So here on number three, you can see the prophage being excised from the chromosome. Does that make sense to you? It's it's not exactly like splicing, but kind of same idea. Does that make sense? Yes. You caught me off guard. I can bullshit and give you some acronym, but I don't want to. I listened to to uh, a podcast recently, and they mentioned something. It's it's some acronym. They all called acronyms. They don't have like really names. Uh, you can look at VB eight twenty two or something. That's really ton like. The phage T2, T4, you know, like lambda, lambda phage, famous lambda phage is lysogenic. Yes. So lambda phage, it's a bit digression. Lambda phage was one of the main tools in studying bacterial genetics in the 70s. When, interestingly enough, a bunch of physicists that were done with creating nuclear apocalypses moved on into biology and they really they really made a difference i think a couple of them got nobel prize <laughs> max delbruck was trained as a physicist and, and eventually got phage, became phage biologist so lambda phage as far as i remember is the lysogenic phage so yeah you can check it out uh, lysogenic? Okay. So, what I was talking about. Oh, yeah. So, lysogenic, the prophage of lysogenic phage is getting excised from the chromosome. Clear? Excision is not perfect. And sometimes, it has, you see that tiny little red fragment over here? I'm going to erase it just put an arrow to it. Can you see a tiny little red or purple or violet, whatever you want to call this color, fragment, tailgating the blue one? Do you see that? It's, no? It's really, really small. I don't have any means to make it larger. That's what I'm trying to do. Just one second. Uh -huh. It's physically attached. I'm trying to open a, a smart notebook, but it doesn't seem very smart. No, it doesn't show up. Let me see. Smart notebook is just kind of a way to draw things. So I'm going to try and... Okay, there we go. So let's try and do it our way. This is a bacterial cell, right? This is a circular bacterial chromosome. With me? And this is the virus. Okay. That makes sense. So, next step, viral DNA gets into the cell. Right? Following? Next step, it gets incorporated.
it lives like that for some time. Next, it gets excised. Now, excision, it's not up to scale. So, like, sizes may <laughs> differ from picture to picture. But the deal is, you see it has a, a pinch of bacterial DNA at its end. Okay? No, I don't want to save any changes. Okay. Now, next step. Remember what happened there? So we've got this bacterial cell with a chromosome and with a short fragment of bacterial DNA attached to a viral one. Does that make sense? So genes that are on bacteriophage DNA, they get expressed, making new bacteriophages. You with me so far? So we've got cell. I'm going to draw only one bacteriophage if you don't mind. So this is your bacteriophage. Okay? And inside of it is bacteriophage DNA and the fragment of bacterial one. Does that make sense to you? They're going to package like this. So at this moment, cell's going to die because accumulation of bacteriophage particles is going to kill it. So this one is dying. Actually, can it make a really nice movie? Okay. And then we have a new cell. I'm going to draw it in green, showing that it's a new one. Okay. It's a new cell with its DNA, right? And we have this bacteriophage. And inside of it is... Bacteriophage DNA and bacterial. You with me, all of you? So I'm going to make it a movie now. The viral DNA that carries a bacterial fragment is introduced inside. And since it's a lysogenic phage, what's going to happen to that thing? It's, it's going to insert itself in the DNA. And what you're going to have, let me draw it. You're going to have viral DNA, the prophage, right? And you're going to have a fragment of bacterial. Does that make sense? Now, this green bacterium received not only phage DNA, but also a piece of bacterial DNA from another cell. Does that make sense? You got it? Now, this process seems terribly random and it is and the fragment that will be transferred from one cell to another may not be beneficial it may in fact may be really bad you know and reduce the the fitness of bacteria and they're gonna die and that's totally fine but if it's beneficial they will survive and you know it's gonna increase their fitness and they're gonna be better than others does that make sense to you so this is called Specialized transduction. So, like in the really nutshell, on a really, really basic level, generalized transduction is when lytic phage carries a fragment of bacterial DNA from one bacterial cell to another. And in specialized transduction, lysogenic phage carries a fragment of bacterial DNA from one bacterial cell to another. Okay? We're good? Now, that's... These two are... The transduction and transformation are pretty common in a bacteria. This one is really awesome. This is called conjugation. And... You can kind of infer from the name, conjugation is also called a bacterial sex. Okay, although it's not sex really. So here on the left, you can see 
donor cell or F plus cell. F plus stands for fertility plasmid. Okay. So far, fertility plasmid. Okay. This fertility plasmid can carry something. But what's important, fertility plasmid encodes the genes that allow donor cell to form a pilus. So pilus is formed between the donor cell, or F plus cell, and the recipient cell, or F negative cell. Okay? Pilus, sex pilus that is formed between these two cells is essentially a tube. So fertility plasmid is copied and one copy of it is transferred into the recipient cell. Does that make sense? So now we have one F positive cell and another F positive cell. Does that make sense to you? That's pretty cool, I think. And you can, you can imagine why it is called sex because, well, kind of by far-fetched analogy, this is basically a male. And, you know, you can say that's, that's a male. That's the female. We don't call them this, but the only difference from, you know, sex and eukaryotes is that in this case, like, female becomes male. You know, so conjugation is extremely important in transferring genetic material between the cells. Um, what is really fascinating about bacteria is that there are no limits, technically speaking, on the interspecies quote-unquote breeding. Let me explain what I mean. Imagine that you have a microorganism called Shigella sonae. It's called, it causes Shigellosis, which is a terrible digestive disease with dysentery, pus in the stool, really bad disease. Okay, really terrible dysentery. There are about 30,000 cases of 30 or 13. Well, we get it just several. Tens of thousands of cases of shigellosis every year in the United States and Europe. This infection causes dysentery because there are two shigatoxins present in shigella. Now, if shigella dies, its DNA gets chopped up and is released in the environment. If there is E. coli around, it can pick up those DNA fragments via transformation. And now we've got on our hands. 07H157 strain of E. coli, which is made famous here in the United States because of, uh, no, Chipotle is much easier. No, Romaine lettuce outbreak. You may have heard about it several months ago. That was a, a 07H157. If Chipotle would do it, I would never forgive them. No. Chipotle had just regular E. coli. It's fine. It's, it's, not, it's not a bad thing. Um, and considering how good Chipotle is, you can, you can tolerate a couple of days of diarrhea. Anyway, so my point is you have one species being a donor of DNA and another species being a recipient. It turns out in conjugation it can happen sometime as well. Species should be close. You probably won't be able to transfer DNA from uh, holophilic archaeon to acidophilic bacteria, not only because of environmental differences, but because sheer differences in structure of the cell, well, like, they're really, really distant. But if we talk about uh, gram-negative enterobacteria, Clipsiella and E. coli, I think it was shown that uh, genes from E. coli can get into Clipsiella. I believe there was a study in Netherlands that demonstrated the drug-resistant resistance genes in E. coli found in chicken, successfully transferred through conjugation, were found on fertility plasmid, and eventually that fertility plasmid ended up in Clipsiella and caused infection in humans, like kidney infections and stuff. 
So that's the problem. It doesn't, those two, this cell, the, the F plus and the F minus, they don't have to be the same. That constitutes quite of a problem here. Okay? And we're going to talk about the importance of gene transfer just in a second. So another um, sort of take on fertility plasmid is so-called high frequency recombination cells. So some fertility plasmids can recombine with a bacterial chromosome and do it frequently. So what does that mean? This is the F plus cell. You see that? You have a chromosome on the left, blue, and you have F plasmid on the right, purple. During recombination, F plasmid, and remember this picture is not up to scale, F plasmid is inserted into a bacterial chromosome. That's normal recombination. It may be the entire plasmid or it may be a fragment of it. That's that's normal process. It's going to be non-homologous recombination in the bacterial DNA. Then, after a while, this F plasmid will get excised from the chromosome. Does that make sense? But remember what happened to bacteriophages? Excision is not precise. That removal of F plasmid from chromosome is not precise. So it takes an ETBT fragment with it, and now this new plasmid has something else that it borrowed from the chromosome of the F cell. Does that make sense? So these high-frequency recombination events, they increase genetic variability of the F plasmids. They now, now it's called F prime. And they add more genetic diversity into the population pool of bacteria. Does that make sense? And it's really important to remember that when we talk about bacteria, we don't really talk about single cells, especially when we talk about bacterial ecology and survival. We talk about population. Numbers like billions and trillions and quadrillions of cells and if, I don't know, a couple million cells got some genomic changes that are incompatible with survival, who cares? Others will become more fit. Now, why we are so concerned about horizontal gene transfer from clinical perspective, horizontal gene transfer between different bacterial cells? Think about this. If you have antibiotic resistance gene, on the plasmid. It can be fairly easily delivered by transformation into other bacterial cells, allowing this antibiotic resistance to spread through population. And if we have... Now, transformation is somewhat random process, right? Recipient cell, right here, may or may not take up the plasma, right? I mean, it may or may not happen. These two things may never encounter each other. So it's, you know, yes, no, we, we don't really know if it's going to happen. Sorry. Now, in this particular event, in the conjugation, it's very much directed events. We have a plus cell, F minus cell, they form pilus. Delivery is going to happen. So if you would read manuscripts from, there's a mag, there's a, there's a, a, a scientific journal, something like antibacterial and antimicrobial agents or something like that, that basically works, you know, publishes papers about antibiotics. And it publishes papers about antibiotic resistance. And you read about, you know, finding new bacteria with antibiotic resistance genes in the chromosome and scientists well what can we do it happens because transduction is, the efficiency of transduction isn't particularly high it takes a lot of time to 
spread the resistance gene using bacteriophages. And I once read a little excerpt about a new study that found a carbapenem resistance. Gene carbapenems are great antibiotics. Carbapenem resistance genes on the F plasma. And the whole tone of that little story was could be described better with a phrase, we're all doomed, we're all going to die. That's it, the end of the world. From bacterial, you know, bacteriologist standpoint, that is the end of the world. Because if there is antibiotic resistance gene on that plasmid, you need one F positive cell, and it's going to spread through the population like a wildfire. Yes. So all these the trains have shown translation and transformation. Tra transformation, yes. Uh -huh. They're all considered forms of mutation. They consider still different. That's a good question. They considered form of horizontal gene transfer. And that's different from mutations? Yeah, because when we talk about mutation, we talk about fairly small events. Point and when when I told you, you know, frame shift. Frame shift uh, arises from like insertion of two, one, two, four, five nucleotides. Because if you insert 124, that's not frame shift mutation. That a full blown modification of a genome. That's horizontal gene transfer. If you if there is an insertion of like a couple hundred nucleotides, that's probably gene. Because those mutations, they kind of small, they affect a very small part of DNA. You see the difference? Here we transfer a chunk. Okay. Good. Now we're going to, I'm going to talk about some of that stuff that regulates the gene expression. I find it immensely cool. So we're going to talk about riboswitches. Now, what I like about some of the concepts of modern molecular biology, if you dig really, really deep into structural aspects, regulatory aspects, you can stop seeing forest behind the trees. And if you step back and look at the concept, it's marvelously elegant. So it's absolutely true for riboswitches. Ribo refers to which molecule? RNA. So RNA here is shown in purple. So riboswitches are found in RNA. Now we talked about RNA structure. It's a single-stranded molecule, right? Um, and it's mRNA. So mRNA is always single-stranded molecule, correct? So, and we also mentioned then that RNA can form secondary structures, this hairpin loops, okay? So basically, riboswitch is a secondary RNA structure, a hairpin loop, that can bind a small molecule regulator. You ask, what small molecule? Well, it depends on the riboswitch. It can be a metabolic product, it can be a nutrient, it can be a drug, um, it can be some kind of a messenger molecule, very short, like dipeptide or something. Does that make sense? All kinds of molecules. But here's what happens. Here on top, the riboswitch in the on position. It permits something to happen and we'll get to what? Right? Now, here's what happens. You see that small molecule thing here and here. Small molecule binds to the riboswitch. And it changes its structure. And small molecule puts it in the off position. Is that clear? It's not a perfect analogy, but it's a switch thing. So it's like me coming over there and clicking the button, and it's off. Does that make sense? Or like in the old James Bond movies, 
when the villain wants to destroy the world, they have this giant key, they insert it in the doomsday device, and they turn the key. So if the key is in, the device is on. The key is out, the device is off. Does that make sense? So that key in this case is a small molecule. If the key is in, well, it's opposite. If the key is in, small molecule is in, ribo switch is turned off. If the small molecule goes away, ribo switch goes back to the on position. Am I clear? Right? Awesome. What does it regulate? Two processes associated with mRNA. Either transcription or translation. So, if riboswitch is on, RNA polymerase right here can continuously synthesize mRNA molecule. And if riboswitch is moved to the position off, RNA polymerase detaches from DNA, so mRNA cannot be elongated anymore. That's it. Does that make sense? Or riboswitches can regulate translation. Melanie, good. Ask me a question if something seems off. Yes. So during transcription, if riboswitch is on, transcription proceeds. If riboswitch is off, RNA polymerase leaves the transcription complex and synthesis of mRNA stops. Good? That's transcription. Same, basically the same story as in the translation. If the ribose switch is on here, ribosome can bind to mRNA and synthesize a protein. When ribose switch gets into the off position, ribosome cannot bind to mRNA cannot synthesize the protein, translations out. Does that make sense? It's a switch. Like, really, like, don't try to um, overcomplicate things. It's a switch. And since it's a switch in the RNA, it can regulate transcription or translation. Does that make sense? Either mRNA synthesis or use of mRNA as the template for protein synthesis. Now, one more thing that we're going to talk about before the break, just to kind of wrap up this part, because that's going to be like operons and that's it. Operon. Before we start talking about operon, I want to ask you something. Um, anybody, can you tell me, where do you store your forks? Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. <laughs> what about spoons? In the kitchen. Okay, good, in the kitchen. What about knives? Nobody stores knives in the basement, forks in the attic. Extras. Huh? Maybe extras. Maybe extras, but not the ones that you use every day. So don't have to run in the basement for your knives. Uh, go to the living room for the plates and the bedroom for the forks and you know like collect all your kitchen utensils from different parts of the house so you generally try to keep functionally related things all together in the proper place it turns out bacteria keep functionally related genes close together that make sense because many things that bacteria have to do require the expression of more than one gene. 
synthesis of more than one protein. You understand what I'm trying to say? Say certain metabolic pathways, say lactose catabolism in bacteria. Lactose is a milk sugar. Lactose catabolism requires several proteins. So several genes have to be expressed at the same time. And it makes perfect sense to put all these several genes together. So when they are needed, they all can be expressed at once from one part of bacterial chromosome. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So these genes that encode proteins are often referred to as structural genes. Okay. So structural genes encode the proteins. That makes sense so far. Now, just as the situation with your kitchen utensils, you take them out only when you need to eat. This approach applies to structural genes of bacteria. They are expressed, many of them are expressed only when they are needed. Okay? So this is why they have couple of sequences called operator and regulatory sequence okay operator permits or prohibits the expression of these genes and I would really appreciate if you could remind me what is the first step of gene expression come on first step of gene expression and DNA transcription. Which enzyme carries out transcription? Which polymerase? DNA. Or RNA. RNA polymerase. So RNA polymerase carries out the transcription. What does it bind on the DNA molecule? It's right there. The short sequence that is called promoter. promoter. So that completes our story about the operon. So operon has a promoter that is the binding site for RNA polymerase. It has operator sequence which regulates whether transcription is gonna go or no go. Okay? It has structural genes and in some cases there is a regulatory gene associated with the operon. Now the name operon basically refers to that critical feature of this structure meaning that genes in the operon can be regulated their expression can be regulated they aren't expressed all the time at the same level does that make sense? Gene expression can be turned on and off. You take your kitchen utensils before the dinner, but not before, I don't know, you go to the bathroom. Okay? Does that make sense? So how are operons are regulated? We're not going to talk about the regulatory genes to avoid overcomplicating this matter. We're going to focus on the function of the sequence called operator. And the first operon that we're going to talk about is called inducible. And we're going to use lactose operon as the example. Now lactose is the milk sugar. That makes sense. So it's a disaccharide which consists of two monosaccharides, glucose and galactose. So in order to process lactose, to catabolize it, to break it down, in order to get some energy out of it, you need to break it to glucose and galactose. Then you need to convert 
galactose to glucose, then glucose has to enter glycolysis. Many steps, right? Just to convert lactose into the chemicals that cell can later use in its metabolic pathways. Are we clear? Each of these steps of lactose breakdown is facilitated by a certain enzyme. Enzyme 1, enzyme 2, enzyme 3. Make sense? Bless you. So, these enzymes are encoded by structural genes of lactose upper. Now, a quick crash course in enzymatic reaction. Enzymatic reaction, by definition, the simplest one is substrate is converted into a product, this reaction is facilitated by enzyme. So in our example, when lactose is catabolized, is broken down, lactose is that substrate or product? Substrate. substrate. Does that make sense? That's the part on the left. So here, what happens? When there is no lactose present, that's the top picture, the molecule of a protein called repressor binds to the operator sequence. Can you see that on the picture? Now, since repressor is bound to operator, RNA polymerase that's bound to promoter cannot proceed with the transcription. Can you see that? It physically cannot move forward. Got it? When lactose is present, it binds to the repressor and removes it from the operator sequence. So operator sequence is now free. Can RNA polymerase move? There you go. So this is why this lactose operon is called inducible because lactose induces okay lactose induces the transcription does that make sense so far when these genes structural genes of the lactose operon are transcribed mRNA is produced, mRNA is translated, proteins are made. As we mentioned three minutes ago, what's the function of those proteins? Proteins that are encoded in lactose upper. What do they do to lactose, those proteins? They break it down. Make sense? When they break it down, what happens to the levels of lactose? Mm -hmm. It goes down. When levels of lactose go down, what happens to the lactose repressor complex? Yeah, there's no complex anymore. Lactose is gone. No complex. Repressor reattaches to the operator. Is there any gene expression? No. So you see, those genes are expressed only when the substrate of enzymatic reaction is present. So, inducible operons are regulated by the substrate of the enzymatic reaction. That enzymatic reaction that structural genes, proteins in the structural genes facilitate. Does that make sense? Um, I don't know, like, I don't have really a good analogy here, but basically, you know, you're not, well, I don't know, I'm talking about myself, but I'm not vacuuming my floors every day. I vacuum them when I see, you know, they need to get vacuumed. Does that make sense? 
Only when they need it, I put this effort in. Only when lactose is present, these genes are going to be expressed to break it down, to break down the lactose. Does that make sense? So inducible operon is regulated by the substrate. Repressible operons. Well, you can guess they're regulated by the product. So this one is basically opposite sequence of events. So on top, you see the operon working. You see RNA polymerase, this bubble, that transcribes all the structural genes. And you see a repressor hanging out somewhere in the cytoplasm. Does that make sense? Now, these structural genes, when they are expressed fully and proteins are synthesized, those proteins produce amino acid tryptophan. And as these genes are expressed, more and more proteins are made. What happens to the tryptophan levels? They go up, yeah. Tryptophan level increases. More and more tryptophan leads to formation of the complex between the tryptophan and repressor. Now, this complex, in this case, binds to the operator sequence and stops it. Stops transcription from happening. That makes sense? It's like, you know, if you are a reasonable boss, I don't know, it's a manufacturing plant, you know, you make things, you put them in a, in a warehouse, but you're not going to just keep producing stuff. If your warehouse is totally full, you're going to say, okay, we're going to stop until we sell all that thing. And tryptophan will be eventually used by the cell in the process of protein synthesis. As it is used, its level is going to go down. This complex as tryptophan levels go down will disassemble and you've got tryptophan operon working again. Now in this case you can see that the product of enzymatic reaction binds the operator repressing the transcription, stopping it. Do you see the difference between inducible and repressible operon? So what you need to focus, since it's multiple choice, you're not going to get a chance to describe me the works of repressible versus inducible operons. I can ask you about what's the difference between promoter, operator, or stru and structural genes. So if I ask you, you know, repressor binds to what? Operator. RNA polymerase binds to what? Promoter. What is the product of structural genes? Some kind of proteins, you know, maybe enzymes. That's one. Two, if I give you a detailed description of an opera, and I mean it, detailed description, you should be able to identify it as being repressible or inducible. Whenever I give you a detailed description in the exam, you I encourage you to come to me and ask more questions if this description doesn't seem complete enough. I will reiterate this whole thing with you together to make sure that, you know, I bring you up to speed, right? So you may expect this. And absolutely no. If I ask, you know, which component of enzymatic reaction regulates inducible operons? Substrate. Repressible operons product. What do they bind to substrate and product? They bind to repressor. Does that make sense? Be able to answer to those simple questions. Those are simple questions. You know, they are. The question, what does substrate bind to in the inducible operon? It binds to repressor. That's a simple question. Be able to integrate these simple questions in a more longer, more complex story, okay? Something like, which of the following statements about inducible operon is correct? You're going to get some answers and you can figure it out. I don't 
remember if I mentioned it, I do allow and actually encourage the brain dump during the exam. When you get the questions, I allow you to use a scratch paper to put whatever flow chart schemes you want to. I'm not going to let you to bring it with you, but you can get a clean sheet of paper and write it down. I don't consider cheating. Does that make sense? If you don't have enough space on the exam itself. Deal? Any questions? No? Okay. 